I first heard Bob speak in 2007 on the subject of war and literature in Missoula, Montana. He was on the top of my list of people that I wanted to seek out when I landed at Berkeley in 2008. And I um, was able to hear Bob speak for the first time in 2009 when he won the Faculty Research Award. Yes, a poet can receive this honor at UC Berkeley. I had the privilege of being Bob's B GSI in um, the, the, the following fall in the Introduction to Environmental Studies course, which is, uh, many of you are aware, is a very rare integrative um, introductory course co-instructed by our very own Gary Spazito. Is Gary here? Gary should be on his way, I hope. Um, and this is the longest running co-taught course um, at UC Berkeley. So that's another feather among many um, that Bob carries. Here's just a small sampling of the things I've come to appreciate about Bob. He's not just a poet. He has a tactful yet bold and outspoken voice. His volumes of poetry uh, sit in a bookshelf next to my bed, and I often reach for them um, to help reorient my often uh, frumpled graduate student mind. It takes me to another place. Oopsie. Bob is in um, incredibly high demand and yet he makes himself available to the UC Berkeley community and especially to his students. He has an indelible smile and he listens softly before speaking. Bob's campus tree walk is a journey not to be missed before you leave this place. He keeps us alert to our surroundings. Those students might be very familiar with the structure of hydrocarbons. They may not be able to distinguish between a pine and a fir, or even one of the many oak varieties that we have here in Northern California. Bob understands that it might be just as important for a student to spend an hour observing a tree as it is for them to read a peer-reviewed journal article. He takes us away from the increasing level of abstraction we often face in the academy, and he helps us be more attentive to our surroundings. What does Bob have to offer this group of our graduate students who range from the entomologist to the restoration ecologist and the political ecologist? Bob keeps us alert to the beauty of language and the importance of social and ecological inquiry. He lives, breathes, and writes with great attention to precise detail. He places himself inside of his work, as I think so many of us struggle to do. As Critic and Arras wrote, Haas has connected violence, inequality, and injustice to all of the community, always willing to incorporate himself into the same world that he criticizes. Bob helps us see art as an instrument. In our wide-ranging interdisciplinary department, Bob's poetry helps, and all of his writing really, his environmental history and critical writing as well, helps keep, helps all of us engage the imagination in our work. So I welcome you, Bob, for your talk, which is entitled Wildlands, Gardens, and the Metaphysics of the Glimpse, Thinking About Nature in the Anthropocene, a topic Ron should enjoy, <laughs> and all of you. And um, he has very generously offered to stay and interact with um, all of the graduate students, especially um, for lunch, which will be for about an hour. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Marco, for that generous introduction. <laughs> it's a uh, it's pleasure to be here, honor to be here. I've been teaching with Gary Spacito the an introductory environmental course now for almost twenty years. Is that right? Can it be ninety five? Yeah, not, uh, maybe eighteen years, and. Uh, and for me, from the beginning, it was a puzzle what, what the arts and what the humanities had to bring to the table of the work that, which is which here? I'm just going to take this bag from you. Yeah, let me, let me get what's in it out. <laughs> <laughs> 
that I need. Like. I haven't quite figured out what I need. <laughs> so I'll bring the parts of it. Is, is, is this microphone working? So I don't need to it's your choice. do the... So uh, Margot asked me for a title for my talk, and I said I, 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 I threw words at it, uh, uh, and I think it is what I want to talk about. The, the, what I wanted to talk about was is what I started to say: figuring out what's what's at stake in what the arts and the humanities bring to uh, teaching Berkeley freshmen and sophomores a way into. Uh, thinking about uh, an environmental education. And I started doing this partly because I just came to think that it's the kind of education everybody absolutely needs at this point in history for obvious reasons. <clears throat> so I hope you'll forgive me if I just kind of think out loud about this with you t today. Uh, about this question of what's at stake and what the kind of work I do, the kind of work people in philosophy and the humanities do in thinking about the stuff you folks are working on. Um, I wanted to start by telling you about um, uh, the two weeks in March I spent uh, just recently in Iowa City. I left the Berkeley Spring, um, the plum blossom had just started to fall, actually, from the trees. Um, and everything else was blossoming. And I, I got on a plane and flew to Carbon Footprint, flew to um, Cedar Rapids, and then took the bus to Iowa City, which sits um, uh, in the flatlands created by the glacier. They say that uh, there's nothing between Iowa City and the North Pole but barbed wire. Uh, the temperature was about 30 degrees, and I had six, uh, six, six lecture seminar to give Monday, Wednesday, Friday through two weeks, and I sat in a hotel room with a large mirror to remind me that I was in terrible physical shape, um, and, uh, and prepared the exam. And when I went out and tried to walk or went to the gym because of the mirror, um, I, uh, everybody was in puffy, um, REI uh, down jackets and walking with their shoulders hunched like that. And I just plowed away on the things that I was thinking about and trying to f give shape to. And a friend on the weekend said, why don't we go down to the Iowa River and look for white pelicans? Um, and um, so Saturday morning early, he came by in his four-wheel, and we uh, tracked south of Iowa City, farm roads staying as near as we could to the river. The whole countryside was that tan brown of, of uh, fallen leaves. The meds, I grew up in California, so it's a, um, it's a foreignly beautiful landscape to me. The, that look of it. And we, we were following the river, looking for the pelicans. And uh, the ice had broken up. The river was flowing very quickly. We come to the edge of cornfields, places where there were trees along the river. It was hard to get entrance to see what was there. And finally, we got to a place where we saw long strips of white. We got out our binoculars, and it turned out to be piled up broken ice and snow on the edge of the river. We drove a little further, and there were other stretches of these long patches of white, one on a sandbar. And the patch on the sandbar started to move. And we knew we were seeing white pelicans. Uh, not that unusual, I didn't want to say to him, for someone who spends a lot of time around the bay. There are white pelicans around here from time to time. Brown pelicans are much more common. but. To see them not unusual, and I wasn't thinking that it wasn't going to be particularly spe spectacular to see white pelicans. And then I saw along the sandbar a hundred or so of them in a colony, some of them 
going like that, some of them going like that, moving, shifting position. The river was flowing very fast. The trees were bare, but there was a kind of that fuzz of red gold of new leaf bud just out. And I thought, oh my God, it's right. I'm alive and on the earth. I'm here. And the uh, pelicans are about 30 million years old. The 30 million year old fossil pelican that was found in southern France uh, has absolutely the, the beak that pelicans have right now. So they've been around looking about like they look for 30 million years. The, there are eight species of pelican in the world, four white, four brown. Brown pelicans are the ocean going ones and, they, and they're uh, tree nesters. Uh, the, the white ones tend to be inland waterway birds. They're ground nesters. And these birds uh, were coming up from the Gulf on their way to Minnesota and Wisconsin wetlands. I was told, though some of them actually, uh, because somebody at the University of Iowa wired a couple of them, find, some of them find their way to Vancouver. Some of them prefer Vancouver to Wisconsin wetlands, who, who knew? And, but here they were, a hundred of them. They're gorgeous birds. Their wingspan is 10 feet when they're mature. They, in the wild, live till they're about 25 years old. The oldest surviving pelican is what lived to be almost 60 at the St. Louis Zoo. They're ancient and amazing, and of course, as young as the earth is creatures. And I was looking at them, and while I was looking at them, uh, above the bare trees, a bald eagle came down like a shot, grabbed a carp out of the river, raised up for a minute and flew off. The story on bald eagles is that by 1905, there were no more left in Iowa, and they were on their way to extinction. It was the first um, uh, legislation passed uh, to protect of wildlife protection. One of the first pieces of legislation, wildlife protection, happened in 1905 to protect the eagles. It was not until 1977 that they returned to Iowa. Uh, out of legislation in the 1940s and then again in the 1960s to protect the eagles, N not so much from an ecological concern, but because they were symbols of, the, but they, they included gold, uh, conservation has made them include golden eagles in the law with the bald eagles. By 1977, after um, something like 50 years, 60 years, they came back. Uh, I have somewhere here the numbers on, on that. Um, in 1963, there were 417 uh, eagles counted in, um, in um, uh, the Midwest. Uh, in Iowa, in 2006, there were 9,000. Uh, one of the amazing acts of recovery. You know, I mean, there's so much evidence that given a chance, the natural world will respond amazingly. You, you all know the story of the of the two branches of Strawberry Creek. You know that when the, when the Tim Pine and the crew at Berkeley decided to clean up Strawberry Creek, they um, planted, after they'd gotten most of the pollutants out and the habits of polluting out, they planted minnows and sticklebacks and said to themselves that they will have done the first step of the job of restoration when they first saw uh, an egret in Strawberry Creek, and I think that happened in 1984. There's a photograph somewhere of the first egret fishing Strawberry Creek, which meant that ecologically they had reconnected Strawberry Creek to the bay, uh, and that was the triumph. The unexpected triumph was that they found nobody planted them crawfish in both, in both branches of, of Strawberry Creek. And not only did they find crawfish, but they found two different species of crawfish, one for the north and one for the south fork of Strawberry Creek. That the work of the natural world is always there, ready to come back up to a point, um, if we give it a chance. Anyway, what I wanted to begin with my uh, sense of wonder and reminder that I was alive from getting out of my hotel room and, and going down and looking at those birds. And that was why I wanted, in a way, to have in the title of the talk, Metaphysics of the Glimpse. 
because for most of us who are not like you, professionally engaged with the natural world, and for many of you who are professionally engaged here but not here, um, that is, you might be working on spiders or um, uh, honeybees, uh, but not on pelicans. Um, the thing that reminds you that you're alive, that we live on this planet, that this planet happens to have uh, a temperature that supported life, that life happened to occur here, and that every once in a while we get a glimpse of the amazement of it. And, that, and for most of us in the industrial age, in the work we do, that glimpse happens as a form of recreation on weekends. So if we're going to wake uh, people up to what's going on, we need to work on the metaphysics of the glimpse. We need to find ways to articulate to people the wonder and the necessity of what they're seeing when they get out in the world. Um, that's the summary of my talk, and now I'll spell it out a bit, because uh, while I was there, I was also to cheer myself up at night reading Elizabeth Colbert's The Sixth Extinction. Um, how many of you have gotten to that book yet? How many have not gotten to it yet? <clears throat> well, it's amazing, and it's a hard read. Uh, it begins with a chapter on the disappearance of golden frogs in Panama. Uh, people just started finding them turning up dead, um, and they were able to collect samples and find out that it was a critted fungus that was causing the death, that was uh, literally stopping their ability to breathe through their skin, and that it was passing among many kinds of amphibians in Panama. And over a period of time, they're finding that about half of the species in South America and Central America of um, frogs are showing up with the critted fungus, and it's very likely that bullfrogs get it and it doesn't seem to bother them, but at least half of the frog species, I'm told, or I think I have the facts right, you guys have to do this measurement, so don't hold me absolutely responsible for, for the facts, but, uh, but I think that almost half of um, species of frogs in Central America and in parts of South America, especially along the top of the Andes chain, are um, endangered at this point, dying in huge numbers because of, and some of this has spread into North America, the species of frog out in Point Reyes that's already showing signs of this. Um, from the point of view of epidemiology, she says, because humans are the carriers of this from one place to another, the mobility of human beings over the last hundred years has in effect um, reversed continental drift. All of the species that were isolated from one another and protected from one another are no longer protected from one another because human beings are traveling to every single part of the terrestrial earth and bringing with them uh, the, the pathogens from the places where they live. So we've recreated Pangaea in a terrible way, she says in the first chapter of this book, and goes on to say that one third of all the amphibians on earth are at the moment mostly because of global warming, but partly because of the Pangaea effect. Um, one third of all the amphibians on the earth are endangered or about to be. One third of reef building corals on the earth endangered or about to be. One third of freshwater mollusks endangered or about to be. One third of sharks and rays endangered or about to be. One fourth of all mammals endangered or about to be. One fifth of all reptiles endangered or about to be. And about one sixth of all birds are headed for extinction. Um, the oceans are now 30% more acidic than they were in 1800. The effects of that, this is chapter 7 of the, of the extinction book, are um, one of the main effects besides the notorious ones on coral reef, which are breeders of much of the biodiversity in the ocean, in the whole, in marine ecology, are calcifiers, snails, and increasingly oysters, and oyster larvae are unable to build their shells because of their being eaten away by the sourness of the acidic 
ocean and there doesn't seem to be much we can do about it because the ocean is absorbing all the CO2 that we're pumping into the air. The other chapters deal with what's happening to tropical forests. Um, uh, there's a wonderful um, uh, bit on the species area relationship and how climate change is altering. That's that one of the basic ecological ideas is altering it. Um, and uh, and she has a lot to say about what's happening to ants and birds. Of course, one of the things that's happening at the higher levels of Amazon, of Andean forests, and therefore probably of forests every place else, that as the temperature warms, the species up near tree line are being pushed into extinction in places where they're unique to their particular habitats. That's happening. Um, she goes on to talk about the die off of bats. She goes on to talk about. Um, the long gloves uh, people put on to shove their fist into the vaginas of rhinos in order to implant possibilities of breeding in them to keep that of the disappearing uh, megafauna uh, alive. In short, it's bad news, really bad news. Um, and um, it didn't help that immediately after reading The Sixth Extinction, Gary Spacito gave me uh, a, a book on uh, called Fracking, What You Need to Know About It. <laughs> One of the things that I thought in the years that I had been teaching this class, when, which involved delivering so much bad news to 18-year-olds, um, uh, is that, um, that the cost of fossil fuels was going to um, uh, get so high as extraction got more and more difficult, that alternative forms of energy, none of them without problems, would uh, simply take over in the course of the 21st century. And that would at least mitigate the problem of climate change by getting us slowly off the fossil fuel economy. It looked like that was going to happen. And then they found shale gas and shale oil. And um, I'm going to move to my notes on that, this other dismal subject. Uh, it looks like there's enough shale gas around, which includes lots of methane leaks. Methane is 72 times more dangerous as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Um, that with, with the, um, the methane leaks that come with it, we're going to have 100 years of shale gas to burn into the air. Uh, in 2000, the year 2000, shale gas was 2% of the energy supply. In 2012, it was 37% of the energy supply. Anyway, I don't think I need to go through uh, <coughs> this list. But what's happening is that deep water drilling, tar sands, oil sands, and shale are making it look like there's plenty of fossil fuel um, for the next hundred years, which means that the fairy tale that I was hoping was true and that President Obama ran on in his first term, that we were just going to put money into alternative forms of energy and everything is going to be OK, is not happening. It's just not happening. and. Um, what information do we need about this? Keystone would provide about 800,000 barrels a day of oil pumping back into the economy. In 2011, uh, the global expenditure of CO2 was 32.6 billion metric tons into the atmosphere. In 2011, 5.5 billion metric tons of it came from the United States. 8.7 billion tons of it came from China. Keystone would only add 18.7 million tons annually, which is only 1% of US greenhouse gases. The core of the matter is still coal burning power plants and whether or not they can be regulated. And there are lots of political reasons why it's very unlikely that they're going to be regulated. And it seems crucially important to do that. So. How do we think about this, and what do we do in the face of it, much of which before we're quite helpless? 
And I'm not speaking so far about the kinds of social dislocations and the issues of environmental justice and human rights involved in the way the consequences of this are apt to fall mostly on the poorest people. One of the ways to deal with it is exactly the way you're dealing with it. Get an education and go to work on some part of the problem and do something. That seems really powerful to me. I'm not doing it, and um, and because you are here and you're doing it, I read over the list of of uh, topics that you were presenting today. It was really thrilling to me to see it. This work is being done, and the only way to keep sane is to pick something and do it. It answers part of the problem, but as I was saying, even for you, if you're choosing to work on honeybees or on spiders, there's still everything else. Uh, in that way, you're no... Uh, you're no different than the rest of us civilians who have to figure out how we relate to this issue. And first thing we need to do, I think, is to be able to articulate to ourselves what's at stake. Um, in climate um, change, I, I, I've been trying to think about categories of, of responses to it that we deal with, one of the, ca one of the categories, of, there are four, I think. One of them is denial. Denial seems to be the position mostly of people in the fossil fuel industries who just don't want to hear about it. And then of various kinds of um, libertarians and Republicans who feel like anybody telling them what to do, especially Al Gore is part of a, a bullying, oh, intrusive government, so they don't want to hear about it. That, that kind of takes care of the, of the deniers, then the next set, large, is the technophiles who think, yeah, it's a problem, but they're not. we don't have to worry about it uh, because uh, people are going to take care of it. I have a friend who is a very successful Canadian industrialist and, I, and an influential person in Canadian politics, and I said to him, what about tar sands? And he said, oh, we're going to be on top of the technology in 10 years, he said. The tar sands have more oil in them than uh, Saudi Arabia. It's really hard to imagine that the Canadians are not going to find a way to get that dirty, dirty oil to market in some way or other. How do people think about it who think of themselves in their everyday life as environmentalists and give money to Greenpeace? They say, oh, 10 years we're going to figure this out and take care of it. So that's category two. Category three is meliorists which roughly where I am, that is, I think things are really going to get very bad, but slowly enough so that my grandchildren are still going to be able, and their grandchildren are still going to be able to hike the John Muir Trail. There's not some epidemic, and they're still going to be able to see butterflies hovering over milkweed, and they're still going to have a, a the, talking about seeing things on the campus, I'm just noticing, if you notice that the juncos on the campus, uh, the little black-headed and brown um, uh, bakery birds um, are have hatched the ca all over the campus there. I don't know how long they do it, but I was watching this little one going around, but the mother was picking and picking and picking seeds and popping them in the mouth of the, of the baby. And I, I'm not a scientist, but I took 10 minutes to count how often the baby actually pecked itself rather than follow the mother around like that. And in the 10 minutes I watched, it only three times actually pecked itself, and the mother was pecking and pecking and putting it. Anyway, th <coughs> this world alive to be seen and looked at and be amazed by is probably still going to be around. Um, the poorest people are going to suffer terribly. There may be some wars because of it. There may be some famines. There may be an immense problem with food supply. Uh, if there are droughts throughout the temp tropical and what are now the temperate zones over the next 50 or 100 years. Meliorists, in this case, people think just are not catastrophists, which is the fourth category, which are people I had dinner with a wonderful writer who's been teaching at Berkeley this semester, Rebecca Solnit, one of the best environmental journalists in the country. She's convinced that doom is just ahead of us as a result of our insatiable greed and blindness. And it's certainly a possibility that that's true. I want to situate myself, I find myself situating myself with the meliorists. Uh, there are ecotones between each of these groups. You can be a, a 
optimistic technophile meliorist, and you could be a pessimistic catastrophist. Probably that's where I am in the ecotone between catastrophists and this. It's it's this is amusing, but really it's horrifying what we're talking about. Um, so. So how do we think about this? What, what, uh, how do we think about what's at stake uh, we're trying to save? Or what, what can my kind of thinking bring to this is the question I was asking myself. And um, so I wanted to tell you a quick story about a recent conflict in our area that, that demonstrates the question that for me came that I tried to formulate the title is by talking about garden and and wildlands. Um, um, in uh, in uh, the national seashore at Point Reyes, which became a, a national park in the 1970s, there's an estuary, Drake's Bay, of about uh, 22,000 acres that's the largest well-protected inland estuary on the Pacific coast from above Vancouver to Cancun. And um, when, the, uh, when the Point Reyes National Seashore became a national park, um, the D Drake's Bay was designated as a potential wilderness area. There was an oyster farming operation on the bay. It's been there since I was a kid. Well, I have some of my earliest memories have to do with being taken by my dad, mom and dad to, to the Drake's Bay Oyster. It was a funky little operation with the shack. In those days, or would have been like late 1940s, early 1950s, the, the little area on San Francisco Bay called China Camp over in Marin was still a Chinese shrimp operation. Sometimes we drive over and get uh, shrimp from the pier at China Camp, and sometimes we drive out to uh, Point Reyes and get uh, oysters at Johnson Oyster. Oysters were not a, not a food on the, on the um, horizon of, um, of 1950s American consumers. That was the heyday of frozen food and Betty Crocker mixes. And uh, it was a kind of exotic food. And it's really only recently, really, the gentrification of Northern California and with the uh, uh, local food movement that oysters have become a fashionable and interesting food to people. And that wasn't the case when the Johnson family signed a 40-year lease with um, the national park that would phase out the um, oyster farm in um, what year? Well, anyway, 2002 or 2004, maybe 2010. I'm not sure what year, but <coughs> recently, three years ago, now maybe five years ago now, for a local rancher, smart entrepreneurial guy, um, bought the lease bought the business from the Johnson brothers when there was only three more years left on the lease, bought it for nothing uh, with the idea that he might be able to lobby Diane Feinstein to um, turn over the wilderness designation to which the bay was going to revert when that happened. Is this a story you all know that going into? So in my community, I live, I spend part of my time summers and weekends out in Point Reyes. And in my little community out there, there the half of the town doesn't speak to the other half of the town over this issue. Because half of, so what happened was Kevin Lunny, this rancher, bought for a song the oyster operation, increased it in size by a third, and, uh, and uh, kind of cashed in on the uh, the, the, I did, suddenly, even graduate students, when they have a little extra money, are apt to have a few oysters before uh, a dinner when they're celebrating. And um, uh, what he's, by increasing it, so he's now growing 500,000 pounds of Japanese oysters in this California estuary, and the business brings in about $2 million, and it employs seven or eight people. 
and the Park Service um, uh, uh, shut it down. Said, okay, the, when the lease is up, the lease is up, it can't be renewed. This was contested. Uh, there have been endless studies about whether the, uh, what, how much environmental damage the oyster farm was doing, if any, to uh, the seal pup breeding, to um, when in my life, one the place I would go to look to see certain migrating birds, black brants, for example, would be only in that one bay. Some people point raised bird observatory saying the evidence is that the black brants have not come in since the oyster operation has been extended into one arm of the estuary, which is called Creamery Bay. It's anecdotal evidence. You can't tell what's going, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the in, intense argument. There are signs all over saying, save our oyster farm. Uh, at meetings, people have talked about food security, the importance of food security in this time of terrorism, serious hysteria, uh, in order to save the oyster farms. And the argument really, when I stood back and looked at it, is another version of the argument between um, Gifford Pinchot and John Muir, between the, preservation, between the conservationist view of what's at stake in the environment, that the point of, of the earth that we've inherited is, after all, human safety and welfare. We want to protect the natural world as much as possible, but the point is to use the resources and use them intelligently in a way that is compatible with reasonable amount of, of um, conservation and what the reasonable amount is, is where the argument starts. With, on the other hand, preservationists whose basic position is um, as much as possible, the little bits, remnants of wild earth should be left alone. Into the middle of this argument in the 1980s, the humanities made an interjection. I think this, I'm looking at the time nervously, but I think this is going to work. I'll be through on time and we can talk. Uh, the humanities made an intervention in the form of um, an essay by the environmental historian William Cronin called The Trouble with Wilderness. How many of you have read this essay? So the argument that Cronin made was that uh, wilderness was, first of all, a uh, cultural concept, that it tended to um, be based on romantic attitudes toward nature that are outmoded, that um, uh, um, it blinded us to what was in front of us uh, in order to protect some fantasy of wild areas and that it needed to be reevaluated. This rhymed with some other things that seriously engaged environmental writers were thinking about at the time. I'm thinking about Wendell Berry, who in those years published a book which is a critique of corporate agriculture in which he begins with a chapter that says the environmental problem is an agricultural problem. And he began by saying the problem with the environmental movement is that it's good at figuring out how not to use land, but what we need is an environmental movement that figures out how to use land well and we're using it very badly. And the next chapter is called the agricultural crisis is a cultural crisis. And he said that speaking from the point of view of the Kentucky farm community he grew up in, that the reasons, the, the carrier of the possibility of intelligent care for a given piece of land or a given watershed or a given ecosystem is passed on knowledge of people who've lived on it and tried to preserve it and make their living on it. And that what we need to do, this is in relation to what was happening in those years to small scale farms, that is they were disappearing like crazy in the 80s um, in Iowa, where I was part of the time uh, guest teacher at the university. You just saw the small farming towns shut down one after another. Um, the guys who inherited farms and farmed all their lives were uh, uh, driven out of that work and were the drivers that took me back and forth in the shuttle to the airport was I went off to blabber about whatever I was going to blabber about. It was, but it was what was happening. And, and 
Barry went right there and said, it's not just that corporate agriculture grows monocultures and relentlessly simplifies what had been complex ecosystems, but that in doing that, it's eradicating the funds of local knowledge and bonds of community that would make possible a nurturing relation to the earth. So somewhere out of these two arguments that, that um, that wilderness preservation was an outmoded, romantic, sh male chauvinist um, cultural concept, and the idea that we really needed to develop an environmental movement that looked to growing communities that passed on care for local environments came the set of arguments that got used by the supporters of the oyster farm in Drake's Bay. And the argument against what was happening at the oyster farm was not based on John Muir's wilderness arguments anymore. It was based on Aldo Leopold's um, ecological arguments. Think of Leopold's moment. That book, Sand Country Almanac, was published in 1949. You could say that the conservation movement became ecological in 1949 with the publication of Sand Country Almanac and the publication of the land ethic. And <coughs> And the idea that we were not preserving wilderness <coughs> on John Muir's terms only from wonder and amazement at creation as a religious idea, creation as a religious idea, but also because we understood enough about ecosystems to understand that the richness and diversity of the ecosystem was what was at stake in those places. In the argument with Bill Cronin about his critique of wilderness, the famous reply was by a wildlife biologist named uh, Don Waller, who said, the problem with the idea of wilderness, as a, I don't have any pro difficulty, he said, with the idea of wilderness as a concept. As a wildlife biologist, I have trouble with confusing the difference between wilderness and wildness. Wilderness is a resonant idea deep in American history, and so far as American history is deep, it's only 500 years compared to the 30 million years of pelicans, for example. Um, uh, uh, but um, I, I, did I lose that complex sentence, the Henry James sentence. Um, uh, uh, not just that um, wilderness is a deep idea, and a cultural idea, but that wildness is really what's at stake. And what wildness is, let's define wildness, he says. Wildness is the characteristic of something that uh, is continuing to evolve in a, in a ecosystem more or less like the one in which it came into being. That wildness is, uh, is catching an ongoing, moving process before it's been radically reduced, which is what humans tend to do with any environment they're interested in. The places that have survived as wilderness are places where human beings can't make much of a living, and that would be not a bad definition of wilderness. Places that got left alone because we couldn't exploit them very much. As a result, and by accident, what we saved were whole ecosystems, and it was Aldo Leopold and Sand Country Almanac who who um, uh, described that, introduced the ecological ideas into the conservation movement and made the famous sentence that the first rule of all tinkering is to save the parts. And that if we wanted to save the wellsprings of what made life on Earth possible, we should be saving as many of the remnant wild places as we can. So it was these two arguments that met this year in the oyster uh, argument. I want to read to you, I won't read the whole thing, an essay by my friend and colleague Michael Pollan to Diane Feinstein on this argument. Dear Senator Feinstein is a member of the Bay Area community and a journalist who writes about the environment and sustainable ag agriculture. I'm writing in strong support of the Drake's Bay Oyster Company in Point Reyes. I have followed this saga for several years now with a mounting sense of wonder and disappointment at the behavior of the Park Service, 
Drake's Bay is an important thread of local sustainable food community, and it would be a shame, in fact an outrage, if the company were closed down as a result of the Park Service's ideological rigidity about the idea of wilderness and its misuse of science. The Park Service has long been deeply invested in ideas of wilderness. Noble as these ideas are, they are often rooted more in fantasy than fact. Point Reyes National Seashore has been an agricultural community for nearly two centuries, as much as the Park Service and the Sierra Club would like to pretend otherwise. It, has preser it was preserved with the understanding that agriculture would remain part of the fabric of the place and understanding the Park Service appears to have forgotten. There are also deep roots to the hostility of environmentalism toward agriculture and antagonism that was once understandable, but that is changing as sustainable agriculture comes into its own, showing people who care about nature that good farming contributes as much to the health of nature, sometimes even more than simple land preservation. Today, the importance of sustainable agriculture and stewardship and the value of a local food economy has been embraced by the public and many thoughtful environmentalists an all-or-nothing ethic that pits man against nature, wilderness against agriculture, may have been useful at some times and may still be useful in some places under some circumstances, but this is surely not the time or the place. The oyster farm, which I've had occasion to visit and bring my classes to, stands as a model of how we might heal these divisions. It is a farm that actually contributes to the health of the ecosystem, demonstrating a crucial lesson for our times that the relationship between humanity and the land need not be a zero-sum one, but rather that when properly managed, the two can nourish one another. What an inspiring story for the Park Service to tell. And so on. Got drift of that argument. So here's um, a letter to Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar, by Michael Pollan's good friend, Robert Haas. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Secretary Salazar, I'm writing to you in strong support of the designation of Drake's Estero at Point Reyes National Seashore as a marine wilderness. I grew up in Marin County and I've been hiking and botanizing and watching birds around Drake's Estero for almost 50 years. Um, I'm also a writer and in blah, 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 trotting out credentials to get there. I've been following the extraordinarily contentious and sometimes poisonous arguments that have riven my community over this issue. I've even used the arguments from our local newspaper in my classes in order to show students how not to conduct environmental arguments. <laughs> I can imagine that you are feeling a good deal of pressure on this issue, and I'm very grateful to you for coming to our community. He came out and took a look at the Estero and take a look for yourself. I should say, in the midst of all the hyperbole with which the debate about the Estero has been conducted, that I don't think the continued operation of the oyster farm would be an ecological catastrophe. Mr. Lunny is not proposing to build a resort in a golf course or to drill oil on the coastal shelf. I just think it's not the best outcome. Let me briefly remind you of the reasons why. The first has to do with the unique opportunity for conservation the Estero presents, and the second has to do with how fragile our environmental protections, federal environmental protections are, and how important a precedent your decision will make. <coughs> Drake's Estero would be the only federally protected marine wilderness on the west coast from Vancouver to San Diego. The reasons why that is desirable, I'm sure you know better than I, but they can be best summed up by Aldo Leopold when he said the first law of tinkering is to save all the parts. The acidification of the ocean, the unpredictable effects of climate change, the accelerated speed with which invasive organisms from all over the world are entering vulnerable ecosystems are going to have impacts on the whole Pacific coastline in years to come that are not easy to calculate, and they would make restoration after disturbances and mitigation after disasters like the next major oil spill along our coast difficult to plan for. One relatively healthy and resilient native ecosystem would be enormously valuable for our understanding of what's happening to our shorelines and their vivid life and how to manage them in the future. As you know, the oyster farm has bred and cultivated millions of Japanese oysters and produces 500,000 pounds of oysters every year. 
There's nothing sacrosanct about the historical ecosystem which the oyster farm displaced some 50 years ago, but if one wants to know what a native estuary looks like, introducing 500,000 pounds of non-native production into the food chain isn't the way to do it. At a minimum, it radically reduces the availability of food to the native species with which the oysters compete. The extent to which the farm disturbs the breeding of harbor seal pups, the extent to which it keeps resident and migrating birds out of the bay, the extent to which the operation invites and will invite the oysters' pathogens and yet other invasive species uh, have been disputed, as you know, in numerous reports and reviews of reports that the study of the estuary has generated. Diane and Feinstein at one point asked the National Oceanic Association to do a report. Um, in the politics of that, she appointed on the commission that did the report only people who were involved in the maritime oyster business. And so that, that was uh, 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 objected to. And then there, was a, there have actually been four extensive reports on these issues. But the answer to which is there's not enough information in all, in all the cases to know for sure what the effect is on seal pups, if any, what the effect is on migrating, but there just isn't enough information. From my point of view, that's not the issue anyway. Uh, the, the, the issue is this basic one of what's at stake here in this particular case. Anyway. Uh, it's my impression there are not enough data to say with absolute certainty how much negative impact the oyster operation has had. What can't be disputed is that a million Japanese oysters in a small California bay is not going to give you a native estuary against which to measure the coastal environment and its condition. Uh, to some eyes, including mine, the racks of the oyster beds in Creamery Bay are visually quite pleasing with low fog coming in and a few cormorants or herons skimming across the water, and so they are. But the advocates of overturning the law and extending the lease for the oyster farm when they argue that the mariculture operation and wilderness are compatible are mistaking aesthetics for biology. No one I'm aware of is arguing that the oyster farm isn't picturesque or that it doesn't make money. They're arguing that we need to preserve a few wild marine environments so that there are some few places on the earth we have chosen to manage by leaving alone their fundamental dynamics and so that we will have an ecological baseline against which to understand marine processes along the Pacific coast in the future. And I go on for a couple of more paragraphs, but that kind of gives you the two arguments the argument for the sanity of setting aside wilderness ideology and trying to figure out how best to make an economically productive and not environmentally destructive environment and to do a lot more of it in our national parks and national wilderness areas um, rather than leaving them, as it were, uh, un unmanaged out of some romantic ideas out of John Muir. And on the other hand, the argument from and, and actually, maybe I'm not putting that fairly, probably not putting that fairly to say it that way. Um, no, the fair way to say it would be that in many, many cases, uh, it's not, as Michael says, a zero-sum game, that there are ways in which um, uh, the vitality of... Uh, uh, the, uh, the vitality created by uh, market diversity in a given place um, uh, and, and, the, and the jobs it provide and the, and the um, beginning of the creation of those cultures that Wendell Berry describes, communities that are vested both in the, in the wilderness, uh, in the wildness of the places where they are, and in the idea that it's a garden that has to be managed, that the idea of wildlands and the idea of gardens are, in many cases, in com are compatible, but can go a long way together. One of the interesting things about this is that they're not compatible. You can't, do, you can't have both. You can have one or the other. You can have, you can have an estuary full of Japanese oysters um, or or you can have uh, one that's not. And, the, and how long it will take after 50 years of oyster farming for something like a native ecology to take over is itself hard to say and would be part of the study of doing that. So I wanted to say to you, 
in relation to this, what's at stake, a couple of things are at stake, and slightly different things in these two arguments in relation to what you do. One of them is um, uh, that we need to think about how to use the land as well as leave it alone. And the second thing is we need still as much as ever to try to preserve what we can of the biodiversity and richness of the gene pool. And in what, that's the place that I had in mind um, ending by saying that, coming back to my thrill at seeing those white pelicans in the winter ice and, and snow along the edges of the Iowa River, that what really is at stake in these issues, and I'm leaving aside enormous issues of environmental justice and what's going to come down for the world's poor um, as the difficulties of this next century accelerate, as they're going to, pretty clearly going to, is, is the little fire circle of the gene pool in the way that human beings discovered fire, harbored it, took it with them from place to place, treated it as a sacred object. We really have reached the point where we need to treat the gene pool as a sacred object, and we have to have an imagination of it in order to do that. And in some way, it seemed to me that that is the work of the humanities. It's work we can all do. Muir's view of uh, wilderness, that peculiar Scotch Presbyterian uh, Emersonian rapture that he goes into may not exactly be available to us, but surely the fact that this planet happened to have a temperature that made life possible, the fact that cells divided, the fact that somehow it, those cells produced a way to turn sunlight into sugar um, and, and make life, the fact that we evolved to figure all of this stuff out and to observe now what our cleverness and technology is doing to it, surely that's a place for wonder, for the nearest thing available to religious awe. And it seemed to me that what the humanities and the arts at this point can give to this argument is a sense of amazement. At we need to figure out a way to make the metaphysics of the glimpse of human beings noticing from time to time. Who can watch it all the time? I was, I, I was going to read you at the end a poem about the fact that um, hiking down out of the Sierra and coming across a, um, um, a, a gentian of astonishing color, I realized that I could only look at it for about seven minutes without getting bored. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, our, that our specific aesthetic relation to this, like religious feelings in general, come and go. You only hang on to them for a while. But there has to be a culture uh, of reverence and amazement for us to figure out what's at stake as we cope with what's coming down. So that's what I had to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob, so much. I, um, I wanted to make two suggestions. Number one, I imagine many of us might appreciate hearing that poem if it's available. Uh, you promised you were going to read some of your work. And then the other thing is that I think we have ample time for some more focused questions um, among the audience for a few minutes afterwards. Is that OK with everyone to postpone lunch by just a few? Minutes? OK, great. And then we'll have plenty of time to visit with Bob um, over lunch in the lobby. For Jeffrey Pine, I have no way of knowing whether you prefer summer or winter, though I think you are more beautiful in winter. Scarlet fritillary, cornally. I don't know which you prefer either. So long, horse mint. Your spotted mix of lavender and soft gray green under the cottonwoods on a shelf of lichened granite near a creek may be the most startling thing in these mountains, besides the mountains. It's good that we stopped just a minute to look at you and then went down the trail because we had things to do. 
And because beauty is a little unendurable, I mean, getting used to it is unendurable, because if you can't eat a thing or do something with it, human beings get bored by almost everything eventually, which is why winter is such an admirable invention. There's another month of summer here. August will squeeze the sweetness out of you and drift it as pollen. So actually, that's not the one with the gentian in it. Um, so, and neither is this, but. <laughs> so this, that's the mountains, this is the coast, you know. This is a, if California's gonna have a, if Northern California's gonna have a religion, it's definitely gonna have to do with San Francisco Bay, coast range mountains, shoreline. September, Inverness. This describes the bay we've been talking about. Tamales Bay is flat blue in the Indian summer heat. This is the time when hikers on Inverness Ridge stand on tiptoe to pick ripe huckleberries that the deer can't reach. This is the season of lulls, egrets hunting in the tidal shallows, a ribbon of sandpipers fluttering over mud flats, white than not, drift of wisps a drift of mist wisping off the bay. This is the moment when bliss is what you glimpse from the corner of your eye as you drive past running errands and the wind comes up and the surface of the water glitters hard against it. Okay. Thanks, so thanks. Bob. That was such a treat.